everybody. That's unusual, but I have. I've heard everybody. I even heard myself last week, so that was all right. Yes. But uh, we have one of my really close friends now. We have uh, built a relationship much stronger than we ever had before. And uh, Pastor Kevin Messner is going to be bringing the message today. And I, I can't wait to give him an opportunity. See, I say that he's from those hills of Minnesota, and he brings stories that will really just knock you down. And then at the same time, he'll lift you up and tell you how Jesus has got you. Amen. He knows how to tell you. So I'm, I'm not going to take the time to do that, but I want you to know that our offering that we normally would take right now, we're going to take at the end of the service. Everyone here knows that. So prepare that offering so that when we go out and put it in the bucket, and obviously you know we have these electronic ways, so you can give uh, Sunday through Saturday, you can do it 24 hours a day. So just keep on giving. Amen. Because see, God is just continuing to work here through Living Word Bible Church. Amen. Amen. Doing an exciting work. So without further ado, I want to bring the speaker of the hour, Pastor Kevin Messner. Everybody good? Amen. Amen. Hey, look at that. That'd be better if my notes stayed up. There we go. It's my wife's Microsoft Surface. She lets me use it on Sunday nights. Otherwise, I'd be using my phone. It's a little too hard to read notes off my phone. So thank you, babe, for your surface. Everybody's good tonight? Amen. It rained last night. How many of you were out when it rained last night? Dear Jesus, we needed that rain, didn't we? Uh, we, were in the, we were in the church, and we were doing our Next Steps class in one of the classrooms. And at first, when it started raining, we thought it was the air conditioner kicking in. And you guys were in Golden Jubilee this morning. You thought the air conditioner kicked in and never shut off because it was cold in there this morning, right? It was like a meat locker in there. But we, uh, <clears throat> it was raining hard. And um, so we got done with the class, and I pulled in the front of the building to pick Christy up. So she goes outside, or she's standing in the front. I run in with an umbrella, and you know, when you've got those 50 mile an hour winds, that umbrella just kind of went whoop, it went the wrong way, and uh, got in the building, I was a little wet, and we were gonna wait until the rain slowed down a little bit, but that didn't seem to be happening, so we just ran out to the vehicle, and I held the door open, and Christy got in. By the time, when we got home, my hair was soaked, my shirt was soaked, my undershirt was soaked, my jeans were soaked, I could have dried off jumping in the pool. It was, yeah, I was wet. Praise God, but thank you for the rain. We, we needed it, and it looks like there might be some rain coming in again tonight, so we could use that, amen? When you live in the desert, you're thankful for all six inches of rain that comes throughout the year, right? In Minnesota, that was a good weekend. Yeah, that was a weekend of rain there. Um, hey, tonight I'm gonna talk a little bit about miracles, and um, you know, how many of you have ever been in a spot where it seemed like you needed a miracle in your life? You ever been there? You needed a miracle. So we're going to talk about miracles and, and look at some of the miracles in the New Testament. We're going to, we're going to just take a peek and, and see what we can learn from those miracles that took place. You all right with that? Amen. You guys are really quiet tonight. You got to be louder because see, if, if you have more people here, if you all bring two or three friends next week, you don't have to shout as loud because there'll be more people. So there's your motivation to bring two or three more people, all right? So let's pray and we'll get started. Father God, I just thank you for um, our time together tonight, Father, gathered around your word in your house in our church. And uh, Father God, I just pray that uh, everybody that's here tonight is here for a purpose. And God, that purpose is to hear a word from you, not from me. And so Father, I thank you that you're going to do a mighty thing. You're going to take the words that I speak and you're going to customize them for each person that's here. Each person that's watching online is going to get a custom message from the Holy Spirit tonight. And so, Father, only you could do that, and we thank you for that. So, Father, I just thank you for your presence, Holy Spirit. I thank you for your presence. This is your service. You direct it as you need to. Father, we just love you, and we praise you, and we honor you in Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. 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 You know, when you, when you talk about miracles, or the word miracle has been diluted so much. Mm -hmm. Right? 
you, you hear stuff and, and we've probably said it, oh my gosh, it's a miracle, our son cleaned his room. That's not a miracle. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about what is a real live miracle. See, we, we've diluted so many things from the Word of God, including miracles. Because we, we, we call things that are common miracles. We call things that are common holy. We call things that are common by a godly name, and it dilutes what God truly intended through His Word. And so I want to take a look at some actual real life miracles. Now, a miracle by definition is something where God gets involved, where man couldn't do it on their own. It would have been impossible for a man or a, a woman, a human, to do what was done. It took divine intervention for that to take place. And so that's what we're going to take a look at. You know, there's been times where, where Christy and I have been in a spot where it's been seemingly impossible where the situation we were in looked extremely difficult one of them was when when we wanted a christy not we christy wanted another child we had uh jeremy and jessica and connor and christy wanted another child i i wasn't on board with that i was like mm, nope done and um and and god did a thing over the few years where where Christy was praying, God changed Kevin, changed Kevin, changed Kevin, and she got the revelation. It's witchcraft for her to change for me to, to pray for me to change. And so she started praying, God, would you just change me so that I'm content with the children that we have? And when she did that and she released it and let go, God did something in me where I wanted another child. And so we talked about adoption. And one day she's working at our church office in, in our church in Minnesota. The phone rings and it's our pastor's, our Minnesota pastor, that's where we were living. It's our pastor's daughter who's working for her grandpa, who's a pastor in Ponca City, Oklahoma. And she said, Christy, there's a lady who's here to come into our church. Her 15 year old daughter is pregnant. They want to put the baby up for adoption. Have you and Kevin ever thought about adoption? Which is what we've been praying about for years. That's all right. That's something only God could do. All right. I couldn't make that happen. Christy couldn't make that happen. Only God could do that. Yeah. That's a miracle. And of course, if you've ever seen our 17-year-old little guy running around, he is a miracle. And um, he's, a, he's a big kid. And we love him. And... He's very active here at the church, and we're thankful for that. Amen. There, there was, uh, just before Christy and I got married, Christy was in two car accidents in about three months' time. One hurt her upper back, one hurt her lower back. At the time, she was a waitress and a um, hairstylist. And so working with her arms up here or carrying stuff here was extremely painful for her. And we got saved, and we got married, we got saved, and... and um, we're going through this lawsuit thing. We got this attorney and uh, we're going through all this stuff. And all of a sudden we decided we're going to go to uh, to an evangelist crusade in Minneapolis. And it was a great healing thing. How many of you remember Benny Hinn? Oh, yeah. And so we went to a Benny Hinn thing at one of the arenas in, in Minneapolis. And, and um, he starts praying. And Christy said, Kevin, I, I, I believe I got healed. I, I, I think I'm, I think I'm healed. And so we went up and got on stage and Pastor Benny prayed for her and it was phenomenal and, and Christy got healed. You know, that was, that was, that was an awesome thing. But then we had to go back and tell the attorney, um, hey, you know that lawsuit thing about the pain? I don't have the pain no more. And so that whole thing was gone. <laughs> but, you know, that took a little bit of courage because you start looking at the money and you go, hey, the money would be cool. Yeah, but I'd be lying to get it. And so we had to let that go. But that was a miracle. Only God could do in Christie's body what, what happened. Only God could bring that healing. Yes. And so we've had some miracles. Now, some came instantly and some took a lot of time. But a miracle, when God intervenes, a miracle is a miracle. We're going to take a look at some of the miracles that I want to start in John chapter 2 beginning with verse 1 and these things are going to be familiar to you but I'm going to read them anyhow 
Um, the next day, there was a wedding celebration in the village of Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, the disciple, and Jesus and his disciples were also invited to the celebration. The, ran, the wine supply ran out during the festivities, so Jesus' mother told him, have no more wine. Dear woman, that's not our problem, Jesus replied. My time has not yet come. But his mother told the servants, do whatever he tells you. Standing nearby were six stone water jars used for Jewish ceremonial washing. Each could hold 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus told the servants, fill the jars with water. And when the jars had been filled, he said, now dip some out and take it to the master of ceremonies. So the servants followed his instructions. When the master of ceremonies tasted the water that was now wine, not knowing where it had come from, although, the, of course, the servants knew, he called the bridegroom over. A host, a host always serves the best wine first. Then when everyone has a, had a lot to drink, he brings out the less expensive wine, but you've kept the best until now. There's some amazing things that happen in this miracle. First of all, it's Jesus' first ever miracle. He had not done a miracle before this took place. And what's amazing to me is he said, all right, go fill the stone pots with water. And it says each one weighed 20 or held 20 to 30 gallons of water. And it doesn't say that he then prayed over it. It doesn't say he did anything special. He just said, fill them up. He now dips them out and take it to the master's ceremonies. Yeah. And the master ceremony says, man, this is the best wine. But let's stop and think about that. How much faith did it take for those servants to fill them up with water? Do you think, okay, now, maybe not you, but me. I would look and go, what does filling these things with water have to do with providing wine for this thing? Are you serious? Can't we just go down to the drive few liquor? Do we what, really? We're going to fill these stone pots with water. Why are we doing that? But they just acted on Jesus' word and filled them with water. Now, Christy and I, years ago, we used to have aquariums, and one thing that we learned when we got aquariums is water weighs eight pounds per gallon. That means these things weighed up to 240 pounds with the water, plus the, let's say, 10, 15 pounds for the pot itself. Those things were heavy. They carried them, because they obviously had to carry the pots somewhere to fill them with water and then carry them back, and then they had to dip in there. So it took faith just to go get the water. But then Jesus, without doing anything, saying anything else, says, okay, now take some of the water out and take it to the master's ceremonies. What would have been going through your mind at that point? Mine would have been, again, they're asking for wine. We're bringing them water. At some point, it took a lot of faith for them to just act on what Jesus said. And then they take it in there and the master's ceremonies is blown away. What if the servants never acted on Jesus' word? What if the servants never acted and filled the pots? What if the servants never took the wine out? See, the truth is Jesus could have done that all by himself. He didn't need anyone else's. He could have just as well filled those things up with water by himself, just miraculously, now they're full of wine. But he didn't. He wanted people to partner with him. Mm. See, it took the partnership of the servants mm -hmm. to have the miracle manifest. Yes. All right. Amen. In John chapter 4, verse 46, as he traveled through Galilee, he came to Cana, where he had turned the water into wine. There was a government official in, a near, in nearby Capernaum whose son was very sick. When he heard that Jesus had come from Judea to Galilee, he went and begged Jesus to come to Capernaum to heal his son who was about to die. Jesus asked, will you ever believe in me unless you see miraculous signs and wonders? The official pleaded, Lord, please come now before my little boy dies. Then Jesus told him, go back home, your son will live. And the man believed what Jesus said and started home. While the man was on his way, some of his servants met him with the news that his son was alive and well. He asked them when the boy had begun to get better, and they replied, Yesterday afternoon at one o'clock, his fever suddenly disappeared. Then the father realized that that was the very time Jesus had told him, Your son will live. And he and his entire household believed in Jesus. Mm. Amen. 
So Jesus goes back to Cana. And a government official from a nearby city comes running to him from that city and asks him for a miracle. How did he know who Jesus was? How do you know who Jesus was? See, I've often wondered, what was the purpose for the first miracle of being water into wine? What was the purpose of that miracle? Well, this miracle gives us a little bit of a hint. Because it says that his entire household, after the boy was healed, the entire household believed in Jesus. The truth is, word must have spread about the water being turned into wine. For this official in the neighboring town to hear about it, to trust enough that if that dude can turn water into wine, he can heal my son, I am going to him. Word had to spread at some point that there was some power in what Jesus said. There's power in what Jesus did. Somehow, this man found out about it. And he came running. And he needed a healing for his son. And then he trusted Jesus. He said, when Jesus spoke it, he said, he just believed and he took off. He had no evidence. He didn't get a text. Right? He didn't get a call. No one came running saying, hey, your son's healed. He just took Jesus at his word and headed home. Mm -hmm. He didn't have any evidence of it. He acted on what Jesus said. When Jesus gives us a word, we have to act on what he said, even though we don't see what he said has happened yet. Yeah. We, we have, have to take action, and that's called faith. Amen. Amen. That's good. That's called faith. But what was the purpose of the two miracles? The water and the wine and the healing. He and his entire household believed in Jesus. The purpose of those miracles was salvation. The purpose of the miracle was salvation, as the whole household was saved. I've often thought about the water and the wine thing. Do you think it really mattered to Jesus that they had enough wine? There was an ulterior motive. He thought long term. Long term, he thought, if I do this, the guy in the next city is going to hear, and I'm going to be able to pray for his son. His son's going to be healed, and that whole household is going to be saved. Hmm. Jesus had an ulterior motive. In John chapter 5, afterward, Jesus returned to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish holy days. Inside the city near the Sheep Gate was the pool of Bethesda with five covered porches. Crowds of sick people, blind, lame, or paralyzed, lay in the porches. One of the men lying there had been sick for 38 years. When Jesus saw him and knew he had been ill for a long time, he said, you want to get better? I can't, the man said, for I got no one to put me into the pool when the water bubbles up. Someone else always gets ahead of me. Jesus said, stand up, pick up your mat and walk. Instantly, the man was healed. He rolled up his sleeping mat and began walking. 38 years. 38 years that man waited for a person to carry him to the water to be healed. For 38 years, he put his trust in man for his healing. For 38 years, he believed in man. One encounter with Jesus, and 38 years is erased. Yep. A 38 year wait changes in an instant because he stopped trusting in man and just trusted in what Jesus said. Yeah. Did Jesus lay his hands on him and pray for him? Didn't say that. Did Jesus do anything special other than just tell him to go do something? All it says he did was get up and walk. He gave the man a command to get up and walk and the man took Jesus at his word and got up and walked away. Where's your trust? When Christy and I were believing for a vehicle or believing for healing or were believing for a, a child, we had to put our, at some point, we had to put our trust in God, not man. Amen. 
Believe me, I was old enough when we got Keenan. I ain't waiting 38 years getting that old before Keenan shows up. <laughs> we got to put our trust in, in God. And then when God gives us a word, we got to act. Yeah, we can't delay. We got to respond. We got to respond. The guy got up immediately. Immediately he got up. Amen. One more story. Luke chapter 17. As Jesus continued on toward Jerusalem, he reached the border between Galilee and Samaria. As he entered a village there, ten men with leprosy stood at a distance, crying out, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. He looked at them and said, Go show yourself to the priests. As they went, they were cleansed of their leprosy. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back to Jesus, shouting, Praise God! He fell on the ground at Jesus' feet, thanking him for what he had done. This man was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, didn't I heal 10 men? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? And Jesus said to the man, stand up and go. Your faith has healed you. Amen. Praise be to Jesus. <clears throat> 10 guys. Jesus pray over him, lay hands on him. All Jesus said is, go show yourself to the priest. How many of you took that, that took a little bit of faith? Because it didn't say that they were cleansed when he said it. Mm. Good. They were cleansed as they went. Yes. So he said, go show yourself to the priests, and nothing changed. They looked at their body, everything was the same. But they had to take a step of faith, they had to act on the word that Jesus gave them, and they had to proceed to show themselves to the priests. And on the way, they were cleansed. Yes. One of them, one of the ten looks and goes, wow. This is gone. I'm, I'm cleansed. And he turned around and went back to Jesus and started worshiping Jesus. And then Jesus said, you're healed. Cleansed, healed. Cleansed, healed. How many of you would like to be cleansed? How many of you would rather be healed? I would rather be healed. Those guys would rather be healed. The one came back and praised Jesus. And because he did, he was now healed. But again, it took faith. It took faith for all ten to run when they didn't see anything different. They just took Jesus at his word and they acted on it before they saw any evidence that something was happening. But one came back and worshipped and he received just a little bit more. Yes. In our lives, all of us, there have been times where we have heard God say or Jesus We've heard the Holy Spirit speak to us and tell us to do something we're believing for. I've heard it, and there's times when I've acted on it, and there's times when I haven't. Because mm -hmm. I didn't see anything. Nothing seemed to be different. It seemed like it was, had never changed. But yet I heard something that said I should do something different. But I didn't do it. I didn't go... Like these guys did, they ran off to the priest. I didn't do that. Like the man who was at the pool for 38 years, he just got up. He couldn't look and see that his legs looked any different. He just got up and moved. But it's because he had a word and he trusted in that word. See, what we're seeing here is the keys to miracles are believing in the word that we get, acting on the word that we get, and taking responsibility for the word that we got. But every one of these miracles required human interaction. Mm -hmm. If people don't do what people did. When Jesus went to, la to raise Lazarus from the dead, he looked and he said, roll away the stone. Someone had to roll away the stone. What good does it do to raise Lazarus from the dead if he can't get out of the grave? Mm -hmm. Someone had to roll away the stone. Now Jesus could have just as well blown it up. But Jesus had people do what people could do. He always has you do whatever it is you can do yes, and the are. most you can do, and then he'll act. Yes. You do the natural, he'll do the supernatural. Yes. You have to be available. That's good. Look at, look at the birth of Jesus. Mary at some point had to say, okay, I'll do that. Mary had to be available. Now the truth is, could God not have brought down adult Jesus? Couldn't adult Jesus just have shown up on the earth? 
He could have just shown up. God could have done that. But God partners with people. He partners with people. He partnered with Mary and brought the Savior into the world. Amen. How about the parting of the Red Sea? The parting of the Red Sea, God could have parted the Red Sea all by himself. But instead, he says, Moses, you lift up your staff and the sea parts. You step into it and the sea parts. Man had a part to play. And if man doesn't do their part, God can't do his part because he always does it for you. Go back and look at all the miracles in the Old and New Testament, and they're all the same. God partnered with people. Yes. He's always part parting with, with people. Second Kings chapter four, there's a, a story where the woman, she, she, she goes, Elijah says, go get all the vessels you can find, empty vessels. And she started pouring, she had just a little bit of oil. She started pouring that little bit of oil into all these vessels, as many as she could find, and the oil never ran out. She needed provision. And she, God said, okay, I'll give you provision, but you got a part to play. Yeah. You got to do your part. Christy and I have been in many situations in, in the past where, where financially things were tight, but we had a part to play. You see, in America today, and I'm just going to talk about America, we want miracles, but we don't want to do anything for the miracles. We just want to sit on the couch and wait for God to move and wait for God to bring the miracle. And that's not how God does it. I hear people say all the time, well, if God is so great, why are there starving people in India? What are you doing to stop it? What are you doing? See, God's going to partner with you. When you decide you're going to help the starving people of India, then God will partner with you and feed people. Mm -hmm. when, you're, when there's people that have no water in their nation, well, what are we doing about them? What's God doing to help them? Well, I don't know. Have you gone down there and tried to dig a well? He, he wants to partner with people. He does his miracles through you. What's the key to seeing more miracles in your life? Being available. What's the key to having more miracles in the people around you? Be available. Yeah. God wants to partner with you. Yeah. God wants you to be the vessel. God wants you to be the source. God wants you to be that pipeline. Yeah. He'll take care of it, but you have to act on it. You're the one who has to step out. Yeah. There's been so many times where we've needed something, but when, when we've acted on the word that God's gave us and we stepped out and we've done something, mm -hmm. God's done a mighty thing. But we had to step out. He doesn't do it and then we step out. We step out and then he does it. Yeah. The lepers had to head out toward the priest before they got cleansed. The man had to get up and walk before he was healed. Of the pool. All these things had to happen. People had to do something first. Right now in our nation, we need miracles. We need a miracle in the United States of America right now. Our nation needs a healing miracle. I don't care where you stand when it comes to our president. I don't care if you're in favor or against. That's not what I'm going to talk about. Our nation needs healing. Our nation needs healing. How many of you would agree our nation needs healing? Amen. We need a miracle. How's God going to do that miracle for our nation? You're right. Through you. Yes. It's through you. Okay. See, we can't sit back on the couch and watch the news or scroll through Facebook and see the news things and just say, okay, God, you got to do something here. God's just going to go. <clears throat> He's waiting for us. It's up to the church to stand up and do something to bring healing to our nation. Mm -hmm. You're the church. Yeah. You are the church. You are the source. You are the partner that God's looking for to bring a miracle in this nation. I want us all to just, I just want you to, I want to pray for our nation right now. I want to pray for our leaders. I want to pray for the people who are in control of this side and that side. And I'm not going to pray for, I don't want to pray for 
oh, I want these people to change. No, I want us to come together as one. One nation under God, indivisible. That's what I want to see in our nation. That miracle happens through all of us. All of the people who went to church this morning, who are sold out for Jesus, we can make that difference. We can bring that change. So let's just pray. I want you to just bow your heads and pray. Father God, I thank you for miracles. Father, I thank you that you are a miracle God and you work through people, mm. you normal, everyday Christian people. So, Father, I just declare right now that I am available. I am available to do what you need me to do to bring a miracle in this nation. Father, I thank you for unity. Father, I thank you for wisdom, strength, protection. I thank you for godly principles for all of our leaders. Father, I thank you that your word takes precedent in this nation. I believe with my whole heart that this nation was founded on your word, yeah. founded on godly principles. Father God, let those principles, let that word rise up again. Let it be the standard in our nation. Let it be the standard in our nation, God. And let us be that standard bearer. Let us be the people carrying that word. Let us be the ones, Father God, that are not causing strife, not perpetrating, Father God, violence. Yes. But we are bringing forth, we are working to bring forth the peace of God. Father, I thank you for it. I thank you for that. If you are available right now, I want you to say, God, I'm available. I'm available. I want to see this nation change. I want to see miracles. I want to see unity. Father God, that's what you want to see. Father, we thank you for it. In Jesus' name. Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Miracles. Thank you. Miracles. I want to see miracles. I want to see miracles. When people come on, I want to see miracles. When people at work when people at the grocery store, when I'm talking to people and they got this wrong in their body or this is wrong or that's wrong or this isn't feeling right, I want to see miracles. I want to see them happen now. Yes. I want to see them happen now. I want to be so available. I want to be there to be that person where I can lay hands on the sick and see them recover. Yes. Mm. Or I speak a word and people are set free. Yeah. I desire that. Yeah. And when we desire that, we pursue that. And we are available to be used of God, we will see miracles. Thank you, Lord. And here's the cool thing. If there's a need that you have, but you're praying for this person and that miracle happens, and then you pray for this person and that miracle happens, and you speak to this person and that change happens, all of a sudden you're going to look and go, hey, wait, I needed something. What was that again? Huh, I already got it. God's going to take care of your stuff. Mm -hmm. You just focus on taking care of other people, God take care of your stuff. Amen. Amen. With that blessed, we all give the Lord a hand praise. All right.